Today on The Grave Talks, A Dark World. A conversation with Dan Rivera. Through living with an aunt who practiced Santeria in the house where Dan Rivera grew up, he knew from a very young age that spirits are real, that spirits have power, also that the living have power to interact and influence the direction of both good and evil spirits. As Dan grew older, he knew he wanted to use his knowledge and gifts to help those afflicted by the spirits and has done so by following in the steps of Ed and Lorraine Warren as lead investigator of the New England Society for Paranormal Research. Today, we discuss demons, possessions, and the state of the world and the seemingly dark path that we've been on and how to protect ourselves from falling victim to the demonic. It started when I was about maybe six years old. I mean, living in a house in uh, Bridgeport, Connecticut, um, it wasn't that the house had, you know, ghosts or anything in it. My aunts dabbled in uh, Santeria, and um, we were all affected by this in this house. Um, it was a four-family house. Um, underneath my bedroom was my aunt's altar, and the rituals that she will be performing downstairs will be affecting us upstairs. So I remember laying down in bed, being pulled out of bed, thrown into a wall, uh, and seeing you know dark shadow figures. Um, you know, my cousins and everybody was experienced in this, you know, in the house. So we were dealing with demons at, you know, at early age. And like, like I said, it just wasn't a, a, you know, a great experience that I had or, you know, sparked my interest in the paranormal. It was just something that happened to us when we were growing up. Let's talk about that a little bit uh, and, and enlighten our audience, those who may not be very familiar with Santeria. Tell them what it's about and what exactly she was involved with with Santeria. Well, Santeria is uh, is African um, culture, uh, a religion that was uh, practiced in Africa. And then, you know, it was picked up in the Caribbeans, you know, practicing um, spells. Uh, my aunts wanted to be, you know, empowered with these uh, supernatural um powers um my ancestors uh practices you know for a very long time in puerto rico when people used to go to my um great grandmother's uh sister to help them be exercised um so she will allow the demons into her body in order to you know help these people to fight these demons which i wouldn't recommend anybody to invite demons into the into their own bodies to fight them um, they thought they were doing something good for these people in which they were allowing these demons to come into them and was giving them strength. What was she aware of what was going on in the house? Was she aware of the negative effects it was having on her family that were in that same building that, that she was in? Uh, she was very aware of what she was doing. Um, yeah, the thing was, you know, my aunt, one of my aunts tried to help her and um, bringing her into the church uh, to have the, the priest pray over her mm-hmm. and uh, ended up what happened and she will, she will be qu- crawling underneath the pews of the church and um, you know you will hear these growls and you know screaming and everything that were coming from her um, so whatever was inside of her did not want the priest to pray over her what was going through your mind as a child seeing your aunt in these sort of states? Uh, growing up as a child, my parents would say, you know, the things that would be happening to me in that house, my parents would say, you know, it's just a dream, you know, it's, it's not real. But, you know, my parents knew exactly what was going on in that house. I mean, you know, we they knew that we were all being affected by this. Um, the only way that I could get uh, protection was myself you know, going to Sunday school classes, talking to the Sunday Sunday school class teachers and telling them what was happening to me. And they're the ones that actually taught me how to pray and taught me how to protect myself. Um, growing up, I mean, you know, it's experience over experience over experience, things happening to me. And um, that's when I got a little bit older, it sparked my interest in the paranormal, which, you know, that's something that I experienced as a child, Maybe I can help somebody that's going through the same thing. And um, I've been doing this for over 20 years now. And um, 
I picked up a vast knowledge of the paranormal, um, satanic rituals, um, Santeria, and I, you know, it, it led me to the Warrens and investigating, um, taking on cases for them and investigating those cases and bringing clients to the church and to have exorcisms performed. Sure. So not only did the Warrens work with the Catholic Church in the past, I also work with the Catholic Church to this present day. Uh, the same church that they worked with, uh, Bishop McKenna, was actually the priest at the at this church. I also went out work with Father Rodriguez in this church, and um, I bring clients over to him for uh, exorcisms to be performed. Let's uh, let's take a step back further because I'm I'm interested in in how this all affected you and in and how it it led you to where you are today. I guess the Sunday school classes that I went to when I was a kid, ever nobody had anything super exciting going on in their lives. <laughs> when it comes to when it comes to things like this, it's like how was your week? It's like, well, we went to McDonald's and had an orange drink. It wasn't like my aunt is growling underneath the pews upstairs right now as we speak. Um, you know, right. it, it, I'm just trying to you know put a little bit of humor into it, but uh, on something very serious and very dark. But w when you w would bring that up in, in class and, and, and you would bring that to your Sunday school teacher, what were you telling her was happening, Cause, or them or him? I'm, I'm just curious how, how they reacted and, and, and how equipped they were just a as a Sunday school teacher to really give you, uh, you know, solid advice, you know, as far as how to move forward and how to protect yourself. I mean, because most Sunday school teachers, you know, that's that they do it one hour a week. You know, the rest of the time they're they're doing something else. They, they have regular jobs and such, um, you know, and usually they're just kind of following the lesson plan of what the, the church lays out. So how did that go? Um, you know, it was just, you know, they were good people. Yeah. Um, they were open-minded, um, being Latin, um, they understood what Santeria was mm -hmm. and, um, they knew, you know, that it wasn't a good thing. And, you know, they taught me how to pray. They taught me how to protect myself. Um, I mean, they couldn't control what was going on in our house back then. Sure. Um, but they could give me the tools for I could protect myself. Mm -hmm. And so I learned at an early age, you know, how to do that. Um, and like I said, and that's why I like being in this field, for I could share my experiences with everyone. Um, I could understand where my clients are coming from. Um, I'll be able to tell if they actually are possessed or um, they're, they're being, you know, Oppressed. I mean, so I know where where to take this. I know what questions to ask. Um, you know, and um, I, I get them the right help that they need. Sure, sure, man. That, that's what you it's know, about. Not every not every case is. You know, when you walk into a house, you know, somebody's saying they're experiencing this, they're experiencing that, yeah. and you got to ask a lot of questions. I mean, in your interview, you really got to go deep into their past to see where where the trigger was, where this all started. Sure, um, a lot of it is. You know. A, a human being could uh, cause their own paranormal activity, mm -hmm. um, but they don't understand where it's coming from. So I could, I could look at the location, I could look at the history, and then I could look at their stories and I, you know, try to make sense on, on what's really going on. So that's how I investigate. I, I dig deep into their past. I dig deep into the, to the uh, history of the location. Mm -hmm. And then I try to put two and two together. Sure. What became of your aunt? Uh, my aunt, I mean, she's still, she's still alive. Um, you know, she still practices uh, is what I heard. And, um, you know, she's always sick. Um, you know, she's been fighting cancer for a long time. Mm -hmm. Um, so nothing's good, you know, came about what she's doing, you know, in her practices and anything sure. like that. And I love my aunt. I mean, sure. but I don't agree with what things that she does. Sure. Sure. Let's jump into the the time in your life where you know you you became you you grew older you you have knowledge you have a lot of experience family experience life experience with these sort of things so when you hear a story from somebody or somebody comes to you and says here's what's going on with me here's what's going on with my my family where many with no knowledge of any of this uh, or or very limited would not know what to do or simply try and brush that person away you're able to hear them out and and understand and sympathize and empathize with with their experiences tell me about that journey where you started to get into the world of of investigating and and what was your goal originally at the time where you thought you know what i i want to use this for some good i want to use these tools that i have to help others how did you get down that road Man, here's the thing. Um, 
when I started my own paranormal group, um, I was going out to haunted locations, um, and I will be getting like incredible evidence. I mean, with EVPs, photos, um, and I'd be, I'll hear these voices. Um, come to find out that I had this gift, you know, my ancestors, my aunts were telling me that I had this gift and everything. Um, and the reason why I was affected by this at an early age is because my aunt, I guess she always knew that I had this gift and, uh, it's something that she always wanted, but, um, she went the wrong way and get in it, trying to get this gift by practicing in Santa Rita and everything. Yeah. Um, so, um, so I took this gift and I, I, you know, I went on investigations and I, at first it was just about the evidence, capturing the evidence. And it was amazing that I could capture these voices. I could hear these voices, you know, and, um, these photos and these spirits will appear in my photos. And uh, after that, I said, you know what? I started thinking, it's like, this is not what I want to do. I mean, I want to help people. Um, I, you know, when you're listening to EVPs, you think that you're listening to some girl that died on his property property. But it possibly could be a demon that could be just messing around with you, trying to trick you to believe that this is that girl that died on that property. Um, I, go, I went back and I listened to some of these EVPs and I could hear the voices changing, more of a demonic sound. Um, and something was telling me, it's like, you know, it's not what you think it is. Um, so we need to be careful when we go on these investigations that, um, it's not always our earthbound spirit that you're dealing with. You know, we're, we're, we're in the field that we're dealing with something that we can't see, you know, and the devil likes to play tricks on us. So the reason why I go back to my roots, how to protect myself is against these kind of entities, because when you're in this field, you don't know exactly what you're dealing with. You're just trying to help these people. You know, you go in a location, you know, they, they think it's an earthbound spirit, I go in there and I really find out if it's an earthbound spirit or if it's a demonic spirit. And if it's a demonic spirit, they don't like it when I go in there. Um, you know, I get sworn at, I, I mean, I could get scratched. I could get, a, you know, really bad vibes about this location. Um, I took a case on in um, PA, uh, Eric Vital was with me, Jimmy um, Penanito was with me and uh it was a really bad case um it was pretty well known over the internet about this location and um i think they had over 52 you know paranormal teams went in this house and investigated um but they could never get the right answers um what was exactly going on in this house i went there they said do you, you know do you guys want me to show you the evidence that uh, all these teams have captured in this house and i said i don't even want to know none of that i don't want to hear anything that somebody captured in his house i want to know what's your story and i started digging into their past um kind of find out there was a lot of things that um we had in common um there's a lot of things that were um never said before and uh we got down to the root cause and where this all started and um at the end of the night we we're sitting at the table and i was explain to them what they need to do in order to get this demon out of their house. And all of a sudden the light started blinking on and off and on in the house. Then it just, the lights just went really bright. I mean, to the brightness where I thought the bulbs were going to explode. Um, and I think at that point we recognized that demon that was in that house that was tormenting this family. And ever since we left that house, there has been no activity in that house. Um, I don't know how to explain that, but they don't have any more investigations in their house. There was a portal uh, in the basement in one of the rooms. I told them to take that door down and let the house breathe. I mean, hang up your crucifix, you know, don't bring any drama in the house. You know what? They followed our directions. They did everything we told them to do. To this day, there's no paranormal activity in the house. 52 other teams went in that house. And there's always been activity after, after they left. Like, sometimes the area got worse. Mm -hmm. I don't know what we did, what we did different. Something happened that night. 
and and went away, it went away. Does it have to do with you wanting to really dig down to the root cause of things and figure that out and try and address that versus many just kind of going in for the funhouse element of it, as I sometimes say, where it's let's see what we can get on tape and then go watch it later. And that's essentially then move on to the next play. Sometimes it's just the thrill seeking that you have with so many, yeah. you know, quote unquote investigators. You know, and that and that's it. You know, a lot of teams go in there and they want to do the thrill seek and they want to capture that evidence. You know, nobody's ever seen before. Sometimes you got to think about if you're helping a family out and you're going into a residential. You know, you got to treat it with respect. I mean, these people they really want help. I don't want to go in there and start something. You know, and then walk away and they're left to deal with this something even worse. Sure. So I go in there. I want to help the family. I mean, you're dealing with lives here. Um, to me, I take that very personal. And when I go into some investigation, I take guys with me. Like I took Eric and I took, uh, Rick Clark. I took Jimmy. I, I got a guy on my team, Chris Galore. He's a cop. And, you know, I told him, bring all your equipment just in case. But they know when I go in there, I'm going to go in there and I'm going to start asking a lot of questions, a lot of personal questions. Um, and they will, they will just, they would just open up to me and I will find out where this all started with. And then I would say, you know what? I'm not even going to bother investigating your house. I know what's causing it. Yeah. So that's where I attack the problem and help the family out without doing an investigation. Sometimes you need to do an investigation, but there's certain cases like, you know, you go in there, you're dealing with the family, you get them the right help they need. And I never give up on these families. They'll be calling me. They'll call me up weeks later, months later. They'll check up, you know, give me an update, you know, if they're – they fallen off the track and they need they need help. I'll lead them back to you know to get help. You I know, mean, I'll lead them to the church or whatever they need to get help. You know, that's what doing a paranormal investigation and helping people out, really giving trying to give them closure. I mean, I've taken people. I've been on cases. You know, when this lady, I mean, and I'm listening to her, and she's dabbled in cold practices and everything, and. Um, she did the, I think, what do you call that, the automatic writing, mm-hmm. uh, where you allow the spirits to come into your body, and then, you know, they could write messages on paper and whatnot. Well, she did that, and it was effect- affected her really bad, and during the middle of the night, she'll be laying down in bed, and she can't control her arm, like, you know, like it, these spirits want to keep co- talking through her, and her husband got really worried about her, and... Um, so they would do um, church prayers for her. Now, they were Pentecostal, and uh, he'll have his uh, pastor and uh, friends pray over her, and she will go, come under possession during those um, deliverance prayers. So they contacted us because she felt that that wasn't helping her. So I went over there. I did the interview with her and everything, and um, I said, you know, I'll get you in touch with my church. Um, I think right now this is the third exorcism that's been performed on her and um, going on to a fourth exorcism. Um, I was there for um, a couple of them, and um, I remember when the priest uh, told me to come to uh, to the door where um, after he performed the exorcism, and he looked at me and he says, uh, she's really bad. Um, he says, like, the devil's got his, gri- you know, his grip on her and uh, doesn't want to let her go. And then um, she was walking out from the back room, and um, you could look at her. Her eyes were still rolled up to the back of her head. All you could see is the whites of her eyes, and she was shaking. Um, Her husband walked her outside of the church and brought her into the car. And I looked at her, and and I said, you know, I'm not going to give up on you. I'm going to continue. I'm going to continue to help you. And um, it wasn't her. It was she was still under possession, and um, you know it took about maybe four hours for her to come out of it. Um, by the time she got home, um, but yeah, that was, I mean that was a serious case right there, and that's just one yeah. you know person that I helped. Uh, I mean I have another case right now. We're we're still going through exorcisms. Um, I got a fast for three to four days before this one, and then um, we'll perform the exorcism on her. Um, you know, these cases, like I said, they go on for years possibly. And, um, that's something that, uh, I think that separates us from the rest. Um, uh, we help these families. And like I said, it could be years that we're doing this. Um, but I can only lead them to the path. I mean, they yeah. need to do the work. And if I get 
too emotionally involved in it, it will affect me. It will affect my family. Sure. So what I tell them, you know, I'm bringing you to the church. You have to follow our direction. And um, just, you know, that's all we can do. And that, that's what I love about doing yeah. um, my yeah. investigations and being part of the Warrens because I've learned a lot from Lorraine. Sure. Uh, are, are there ever cases where... Even when they are following your direction, even when you've you've brought them to the church and said, you know, I'm doing as much as I can in my part, but this is a joint effort. This is, you know, it's like therapy to a certain extent. Both parties have to be participating for it to work. Uh, when you you get them there, they're they're following it, but you're you're having to constantly follow up, and you're constantly, uh, or at least on a annual basis or semi annual basis or somewhat regularly, perform exorcisms because whatever this is that has its grip on the person is not leaving is not going away does that is that ever an indefinite process where it's almost like i'll compare it to a medical condition where well you find out you have this and uh, or you're deficient on that and you're going to need to take this uh this supplement for the rest of your life in order to not be deficient on that because your body simply will not produce it no matter how much you you will it to or how much you study it or read it or believe that you should have it your body just yeah. simply won't do it is there ever cases like that where an exorcism or someone who is possessed almost needs to be just on a maintenance schedule for lack of a better term for the rest of their lives in order to keep these things pretty at bay? Much, pretty much. I yeah. mean, I, I mean, you have to follow certain rules. You allow this demon to come into your life. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it's always going to leave that, that, that crack in your aura. It's always going to be there. Sure. But, I mean, you, if you have the tools to know how to fight it, then you, you, know, you have a chance on living a normal life. But if, it's easy to fall back onto your old habits and these things start affecting you again. Um, for instance, I mean, we talk about um, one of the uh, Ed and Lorraine's cases, the Maurice case. I mean, they yeah. did an exorcism on Maurice. A um, couple years went by, and Maurice started dabbling in occult practice again, and he started, you know, going under possession. And, you know, he ended up shooting his wife's arm off, and he ended up blowing his head off. Yeah. You know? It's just, uh, it's just a crazy, it's a crazy thing. But, uh, you know, we do it. Um uh, and I don't think a lot of people believe, you know, uh, you know, that we actually are still involved in, you know, carry on this uh, tradition that the Warrens, you know, did before us. I mean, but we, we're still doing it. Sure. We're still working with the same church. Yeah. Oh, I think listeners to our program are aware because we we talked to a lot of folks in your group and over over time and and uh, and Chris, their grandson and such, too. But the general public, you're right, probably not not as aware uh, as as they they, they should be um, when we're talking about um, the root causes for demonic activity or possession in someone's home or or on them themselves it, right. it, it is. Obviously, there, there's a plethora of, of possible things that could invite that sort of activity in. And and I know a lot of cases are private. You're, you're not here to, to share the, the details of who or, or where or anything like that. And, and that's fine. But I, I'm more so curious about what you see you know, more commonly, or, or, or if there is a commonality to, to anything when it comes to things that people may be dabbling in, that they're they're unsuspecting of, that they, they don't suspect that this is going to invite something in. Obviously, there's, there's some obvious ones out there with Ouija mm -hmm. boards, things of that nature, where yeah, there's there's enough warning where if you are remotely informed, you know the possibilities of what could happen. But what are some things that you found in your work that people ended up being involved with and 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 unsuspectingly brought something that dark into their world? Well, here's one thing. Um, there's a, you know, in Israel, it's family curses. Um, it could have been the mother that dabbled in a cult practice or. You know, the grandparents dabbled in occult practices. Um, and that's, like I said, when I go in deep and I ask questions, I really go back in time. And, and sometimes it's uh, suppressed memories that these clients have. And they, I mean, they forget about these memories. But trying to bring out those memories of their past. Um, so, I mean, they would tell me, well, I never dabbled. I never played around with a Ouija board or anything like that. Oh, but my grandmother, she was a witch. I mean, she, she did rituals and all that. Well, 
that could cause a family curse because the demonic wants to destroy the human body because we're created in God's image. So they will go on to the next generation. I will destroy your 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 kids. I will destroy your grandkids. Um, that's the way the demonic works. So once somebody is dabbling in occult practices or doing devil worship in, it affects the whole family. It could come on 20 years later, 30 years later, but it's on the demonic, it's the devil's, the devil's time pretty much when he's going to destroy you or destroy your family. What's scary about that notion is is that it, 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 it insinuates that the, an individual doesn't necessarily always have control over that sort of thing entering into their world or into their life if they themselves are not dabbling in something or even inadvertently uh, dabbling in something. Uh, it, right. it, it could be something that was done by another family member. It, on the same note, can that sort of thing happen? Can someone else with ill will towards another bring something dark or demonic into one's life remotely or even with, you know, somewhat of amount of contact with that, that individual, you know, basically a curse is what I'm talking about. Right. Uh, you know, can, well, that could be, that's, that could be very possible. It yeah. depends on the person. I mean, if the person is, you know, a person that's very doubtful, doesn't have self-esteem, I mean, they could be very much influenced by this and then they could feel that they're being cursed and then they could start bringing on this whole phenomenon they, that they could make this happen themselves. They could create it. Um, it's almost like a topa. I mean, you're, you're creating an image and that image becomes real. Sure. And then- but for instance, like the case of Annalise, uh, the girl that was possessed over in Germany. Mm-hmm. Nobody can understand why was this girl possessed? Um, she was a you know good girl she never you know she really was never sinned really much at all and um there was a it was a very religious family but if you think about it it could have been her ancestors something that happened in their past that cursed this girl i mean nobody could understand why was this girl possessed and the demon destroyed this girl over multiple exorcisms performed on this girl this demon would not let this girl go till it destroyed her body. Sometimes, is it, when you look back on that retrospectively, is there anything that could have been done to to not have that outcome with Annalise? Or is it just sometimes that dark power is, is far stronger than even the, the, the strongest exorcist on the planet? Yeah, I mean that. I, I mean, I don't have all the answers for that. I mean, that we'll we'll have the answers when we meet our maker. Yeah. Um, I just know that um, that we do fight this battle. We fight it in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, and um, and that's the best we could do. Um, and there's some cases that are it is successful. Uh-huh. Um, but then again, you know, it depends on the person and how much. How bad do they want this out of them, and how bad do they want peace in their life? Um, like I said, we could lead them to the path, but the rest is up to them. Mm-hmm. With with your abilities, and and we were talking earlier, you realizing, you know, you're you're more sensitive than others. You were you were talking earlier about you could hear voices, you could hear things on some investigations, or or just in life in general that others weren't picking up. Um, when you're you're talking about that, do you believe that because you have that ability, that, that sensitivity that's in you, that gift that's in you, you walking around with a, a piece of equipment trying to pick up an EVP or, or trying to pick up some sort of evidence or trying to communicate in some way, shape, or form, or, or taking pictures or getting film of something, are things more likely to show up on, on that device, whatever it may be, because you're holding on to it than someone who does not have those gifts almost, you know, like you're a better antenna, if you will, uh, than, than someone who is, is not a, a, as strong of an antenna for picking these sort of things up. Well, and that's the thing. I mean, what Lorraine would tell me is, um, is someone's aura. Mm-hmm. Um, if you have a very bright aura, if you're a good person, your aura shines. So people gravitate to you, spirits gravitate to you because you shine. 
all right now if you're a negative person all right your aura has got a bunch of bunch of chinks in it mm -hmm. all right so the evil spirits are very attracted to that because they see openings where they could get in so having a gift is you know it helps out on investigations but if you're a very negative person they could also pick up evidence as well because they're they're a target mm -hmm. you know and you hear about some of these investigators after that they've done an investigation weeks months later they're being tormented sure you know it, it's just like you know people need to be careful when they go on cases like this they see these movies they see um all these paranormal shows oh i want to do that blah blah this and that but they don't know how to protect themselves i mean i go to the church i have a blessing done i have my teammates on my my on my team that also go to the church and they also have a blessing performed over them because we want to be careful in what we're doing i mean we have to go in there with the right intentions to help somebody um you know it's a learning experience too as well we could go to haunted locations we could learn how to investigate we could learn how to ask questions and how we ask our questions has the blessings always been successful for you like when you come out of a case have you ever gone back home and there's something else that's come back with you, even though you took all the precautions you thought you could take? Yeah, I mean, like I said, I, that, it's one of the reasons why when I first started this, um, and I wasn't working with the church at the time. Mm -hmm. I mean, I used to go on investigations, and then I would come home. And then, you know, I mean, I, I could have had attachments come with me from other investigations that could have affected my family. Um, you know, I'm not, not going to say that it didn't. I mean, my son will say you know, that I see this shadow figure uh, walking upstairs in my room, you know, and then, you know, I would go up there and I will bless his room and, uh, you know, ask that negative spirit to leave in the name of Jesus Christ and everything. And um, I think my son is very sensitive. He sees things, he hears things, and uh, it freaks him out, you know, every once in a while. But um, I'm trying to teach him how to protect himself, how to be a good person. And uh, hopefully, you know, one day he'll be able to use his gift to help somebody. That wraps up the first part of our conversation. Part two for you tomorrow right here on the feed. Be sure to press subscribe wherever you download podcasts so you don't miss that. If you want ad-free access to all of our episodes, simply sign up through Apple Podcasts. Even try it for three days free and binge away with no commercials. You'll also get advanced access to all of our episodes well before they're released to the public, all commercial free. Apple Podcasts, check it out. Or patreon.com slash the grave talks. Until next time, I'm Tony Bruschi. Thanks for listening to the grave talks.